Well, I, I come from a Norwegian family up in Minnesota. <laughs> uh, my folks grew up in farms in the Noman Twin Valley area. And uh, my dad didn't want to be a farmer, so at the, uh, at the start of the war, I was born in 1939. At the start of the war, he uh, moved along with part of his family to Bremerton to work in the shipyard. So that's why we moved from Minnesota out west and uh, ended up in Roseburg, Oregon, lumber town, lumber capital of the world. But I grew up in Roseburg. My dad passed away when I was uh, 12, a brain tumor. And I uh, had uh, two brothers and a sister and a mom who uh, had no formal training, education of any kind. So she was trying to raise the four of us, which is a tough road to hold, but uh, we we're kind of on the wild side, free to roam town or anything as kids. My uh, brother Dan, when he was about 11 years old, was adopted out of our family by some close friends of ours, and they moved to Nebraska. So I grew up without knowing my uh, second brother, Dan. And uh, after graduating from high school, uh, I enlisted in the Air Force. I was in Silver Air Patrol for a couple of years, and that got the Air Force bug in me because I loved flying. So I went to uh, Lackland basic training in 57 and uh, was going to be a Russian linguist. In CAP, we did a lot of Morse code, so they thought I knew a lot about electronics and everything. So they assigned me to the Russian linguist school, and uh, they had a, a um, job fair. And I uh, noticed a display of survival equipment, and I was looking at it, and it turned out to be the survival instructors from a state Air Force base, Air Force Survival School, who were recruiting instructors. So I talked to them, and I decided that I'd try out for it, and was selected to be an Air Force survival instructor. So. After finishing basic training, I uh, went to the survival school at State Air Force Base, Reno, Nevada, went through a six-month survival instructor course, and became a field instructor for three years. Then they put me in the prisoner war compound as an instructor interrogator. And I spent two years uh, interrogating our prisoners, all, all Air Force members. And at that time, I started skydiving because they had me teaching classes on parachuting to the survival students. I never jumped before and I thought that was kind of dumb. So I started skydiving. We started a little sport parachute club on base and had about a hundred jumps and I got real tired of interrogating because you'd be the bad guy and then turn the switch off and try to be a normal person. And I started confusing the two and uh, I uh, volunteered for pararescue. At that time there were 62 pararescue men worldwide because we've been downsizing rescue ever since the Korean War. and. Uh, the space program was starting up, and NASA realized they didn't have a capability too, too well of recovering astronauts from the far place in the world, so the Air Force started beefing up the pararescue program. And uh, I'd already had the skydiving, so I had over 100 jumps on my resume for pararescue, and pararescue men at that time were very close to the survival career field, almost interchangeable, and I'd been through the rescue and survival medical school, which the PJs went through, so I already had most of my training down. They grabbed me, sent me to a jump school. It was kind of fun after having 100 jumps to go to airborne school and kind of enjoyed that experience. And they sent me to scuba school. Now, nowadays in modern pararescue, they go through about six weeks of intensive water training to get ready for scuba school. They sent me to scuba school right square off the, with no prior training for it. So went through four weeks of scuba school, Navy scuba school down in Key West, Florida. And uh, they sent me to my first team. So that was my training. I went through jump school, scuba school, made five tree jumps at, a, at uh, one of the pararescue teams. They had no pararescue school at that time. So I was one of the very last guys to come into pararescue without going through the pararescue school, since I already had most of the training behind me. My first uh, team was on Guam, spent a year and a half there, and uh, then went to Patrick Air Force Base to be on the startup of the Pararescue team at Patrick for the space program. Spent a year at Patrick and uh, my boss was an old crusty Pararescue man from years ago, almost during the Korean War, and he taught me to go into Vietnam because he didn't, said I didn't want to miss out on the experience. Come to find out, he wanted me to go, so he didn't have to go. But uh, I, five years later, he was over there. But I volunteered for Vietnam and uh, two weeks after I married uh, Louise, left for Vietnam. And the uh, nice thing about going to Vietnam is my younger brother that I didn't grow up with was with the 1st Airborne, which is one of the first major army outfits to go into the war there. They were sent to Benoit to secure the base. And Benoit is where I was assigned. 
So I get over there. Dan had already been there six months. And uh, my first day there, I went across to the Army side. I had a nice little hooch with fans and everything. He was living in a squad tent. And uh, Dan was on long range recon patrols. He'd just come back in from a four day mission out in the jungle. And I walked into his tent and he was laying on a canvas cot, sprawled out, still with the stinky cami fatigues on, flies crawling on his face, mouth hanging open, sleeping. I said, Dan, he looked up, said, what in the hell are you doing here? <laughs> but uh, we spent six months together there. And Dan spent all of his time when he wasn't out in the jungle over at our place because we had an air conditioning alert trailer. So he got to know Pittsburgh real well. He was back, he was Pittsburgh's uh, Pinochle teammate playing us in Pinochle. So Dan kind of got adopted by all of our people and everything. And uh, when we first got to uh, Benoit, our, our unit had really three missions. Uh, we had four air rescue units in Vietnam at the time. They were all HH-43s. We didn't have any of the big helicopters. And the 43s were not designed for combat, but they had a one advantage. They could hover forever with those twin rotors above. They could sit in a spot and just sit there. So they worked real good for uh, that part of Vietnam. They're small though, really too small to do any rescuing or much rescuing. Our main mission was fighting fires on crashes coming in. And the PJ and the hoist operator, or the helicopter mechanic were the firefighters. And uh, in case an aircraft come in that was on fire and crashed, uh, we would fly to it, we'd land right next to it, we carried a 2,000 pound FSK or fire suppression kit with foam. And the PJ and the helicopter mechanic would have our silver bunkers on. We'd jump out, run to the FSK that was slung underneath the helicopter and dropped. And the helicopter would pick up the 43 and its rotor blast would knock the flames away. We'd spray foam into it and it created a path. And my job was to run down that path, climb up into the fuselage, grab the pilot out, get back out before the flames pulls back in again. It wasn't a job we enjoyed very much, but uh, later on uh, they got regular firefighters to fly that mission, so we didn't have to do it anymore. We used to PJ and the helicopter mechanic. But our second mission was air crew recovery off base in case anybody got shot down. And then we had a third mission, which really wasn't our mission, but we were the only hoist equipped helicopters in that area of Vietnam. So it was to recover Army wounded from the jungle where uh, they couldn't get to them. Now, Army dust off did a good job as far as picking up wounded, but they had to land to get them. And when the guys were hit out in the jungle, they'd have to be carried for who knows how long and how far to get to a recovery point. So we had the capability of flying right over the jungle at their position, lower the hoist down. We carried a force penetrator. They could even go down through the trees and uh, grab their wounded. But my first few months in Vietnam, all of our missions involved one or two wounded because we had sm uh, small units of advisors that would work with the South Vietnamese Army. And our, mainly patrols that get hit, we'd go in to get one or two of the wounded out. Uh, about January, February time frame, uh, President Johnson and Secretary of Defense McNamara increased the manning in Vietnam from 150,000 to over 360,000. The idea being that major American units could go in without the Vietnamese and take over the major fighting. And this fight was one of our first experiences with mass casualties, so it was new to us too. And the morning of the, uh, or the afternoon of April 11th, I'd already had three local base missions and uh, I just landed from a firefighting mission. The aircraft landed okay. It had not only just got off the aircraft, we got word that we're scrambling for army recovery. So I traded my silver bunkers for a combat gear and got back aboard the helicopter. We were airborne probably five minutes after notification that the Army had up to six or seven wounded at a location about 33 miles away from Benoit toward Vong Ta. And uh, we didn't know what the situation was really other than it was a major fight and they had several wounded. I was a uh, lead helicopter they called the Low Bird. Harry O'Byrne and his crew were hybrid to cover us. And uh, we arrived on scene, had no contact with the troops on the ground because they were an FM and we had a, uh, HF and VHF. So we couldn't talk to the people on the ground, but we were talking to a forward air controller that was circling the area. And uh, the army on the ground fired up purple smoke coming through the trees. I took a picture of that. And then um, we arrived 
over the position and there was a small clearing where we see troops down below. The, tr the trees are about 150 feet high, a triple canopy. They had a top of the trees at 150 and then another layer at 100 and another layer at 50 feet. And there was just a small hole that we could drop the helicopter down into at least for the first 50 feet. And the, the trees are probably about three to five feet away from rotor tips all the way down. So we had to fly over the hole, drop straight down into it. And we stopped about 100 feet above the, the ground. And I could see the troops down below working on wounded, so we sent the Stokes litter down. Sometimes the pararescuemen would go down, but it was a damn if you do, damn if you don't situation with the pararescuemen aboard the helicopter. Because if the pararescuemen's on the ground, that left one guy in the back of the helicopter to work the litters, which is a tough job. And uh, with two guys aboard the back of the helicopter, it's much easier to work with the uh, litter, plus the medic would be aboard myself to work on the wounded. But if the PG's on the ground, the helicopter hoist mechanic had to operate by himself. So we sent the litter down. I stayed aboard the helicopter. My pilot made that decision. And I didn't argue too bad with him right at the point. But uh, we sent the litter down. The Army guys put the first cast in the litter, no problem whatsoever. We hooked it up and we brought them up. And at that point, we got the litter in the doorway and I told my pilot to go ahead and pick up out of the hole and fly to the side. So I'd had time to get the guy out of the litter over to the folding litter inside the helicopter, re-rig the litter for recovery, we'd go back in. So while I was doing that, Bill's bird went in and to make their pickup. And for some reason or another, our pickup took five minutes. Theirs took about 30 minutes or even longer. We didn't know what was going on, why they were in the hover so long. But come to find out when uh, Bill's crew sent the litter down, the Army had their patient already in a portable litter or a temporary litter made out of saplings and a poncho. And instead of picking the wounded trooper out of that litter and putting him in ours, they just picked up the whole litter and put it on in ours. That litter was eight to nine feet long, now instead of six feet long. And when uh, Bill's helicopter mechanic was bringing the litter up, the poles were getting caught in the trees, flipping the litter sideways. The guy wasn't strapped in properly, almost fell out two or three times. And when they got him up the doorway, they couldn't bring the litter inside the cabin because of those eight or nine foot poles on it. So they lifted up with the guy hanging outside halfway out of the helicopter and flew away. Well, again, we didn't know too much about this. We flew back in, dropped the litter back down and made another easy pickup. And both helicopters flew to Bimba, which was a small artillery post about five, six miles away, landed and uh, my helicopter had already flown three missions that morning on first alert. So we uh, refueled Well, Bill's aircraft had unloaded their one patient, we unloaded our two, they flew back in first. And at that point, uh, Bill and his pilot got in the conversation about whether he should go down or not. And Bill convinced the pilot that things were bad on the ground. He needed to go down and help organize the uh, troopers as far as the rescue equipment, because they didn't know how to use it. And besides, he could decide who could ride the Stokes leader up and who could ride the force penetrator up, because we could put two guys in that force penetrator at one time if they weren't wounded too badly. So. Bill's helicopter uh, dropped him down and then picked up one Stokes litter patient and now they had no choice. They had to fly away with their one guy, which kind of slowed down our operation. My helicopter went in and we made two Stokes litter pickups real very short time. Both helicopters flew back to Minbaugh and now they were refueling. So we went back into that hole again. So this is my first, second, third to be my fourth time into the hole. We come back in, drop down. This time Bill sent up a Stokes litter and he sent up two survivors on a uh, force penetrator, which meant that now we had three survivors aboard and we were not in communication with Bill. He had his emergency radio, but he, he wasn't on frequency. And I sent a note down to him, tell him to get back up to his helicopter the next time it come in, because he had him organized down below. And uh, I thought it'd be a little faster if they could pick up two or three at a time instead of one at a time. And so we picked up from the hole, his, other, his helicopter by that time was hovering right next to us. So we lifted up. They come in, they sat down, started to litter on down, and that's when uh, all hell broke loose down below. And they received fire from a couple points. I guess they got nine or 10 hits while they're in a hover. Uh, the pilot said that uh, he was losing RPMs and uh, something happened to the controls to where he started spinning to the right, or the left rather. So he was able to stop the spin with a full right rudder and they were starting to settle down below and then his RPMs picked up, so this time it increased to 100% power. 
and come to find out a fuel control valve had been damaged and he had no control over his engine whatsoever. But he was able to pick up out of the hole. We were dropping our patient off and we heard their mayday call. So we dropped our patient off and flew right back to meet him. And uh, Bill's helicopter, of course, Bill was on the ground. Uh, the Stokes leader was on the ground and his helicopter mechanic was waving at him, get in the helicopter, I mean, get in the Stokes and we'll get you out of there. And Bill was waving them off. And uh, he, he was shouting him, get out of here, get out of here. So Bill was elected to stay on the ground. He had two or three chances to come up during those other uh, pickups, but he remain, elected to remain on the ground. And uh, of course, in my helicopter, we had no idea how ferocious the fighting was, but uh, they picked out of the hole and the pilot knew he was going to crash land, so he was looking for a place to sit down. And about a couple of clicks away, he saw a small clearing and he started to go down into it. He knew it was unsecure. He knew they'd be probably thick with VC. So he pulled back up. He was still flying, so he said, well, let me try for that road up ahead. And he flew two more clicks and got ready to settle there. And then he could see way up ahead, Bin Ban or Bin Ba. So he decided to go ahead and try for it. They had the problem, they couldn't control the engine and it's kind of hard to land a H-43 uh, with full engine power. He couldn't go into hover or anything. So he decided to make a crash landing, running landing. And they come in at full power, slammed in and come to a stop, but they couldn't shut down the rotors. And uh, the helicopter mechanic finally figured out a way to bang the fuel control valve and get the engine shut down. So, but we'd escorted him back there and we immediately returned to the hole to get Bill. But by this time, the fighting had really intensified and the Ford air controller wouldn't let us in. And uh, we circled for about the next two, two and a half hours. And uh, we had three helicopters, but our third helicopter back at the base was down for repairs. So they flew up a regular B model from Saigon, Tonsonute, that was a non-rescue helicopter. He was crash rescue only, but they flew in to cover us from Tonsonute. And uh, finally at dark, uh, the fighting was still intense on the ground and they sent us back to Benoit, saying that uh, Bill and the Army guys would move to a, a better location and be picked up in the morning. So <coughs> we didn't know too much about what had happened, but we got word the next morning that uh, we weren't needed anymore, that the Army would take care from this point on. And they were wrong because the Army helicopters couldn't get in. So then they scrambled our helicopter again and this time it was uh, Harry O'Byrne that went in. They lowered Harry down to the ground. And uh, the Army had been working on trying to clear the area out a little bit. They dropped chainsaws to him. And uh, Harry loaded some wounded up and uh, they took off without Harry. So as Harry was on the ground, he'd probably tell you more about this. But uh, the Army asked him if uh, uh, that uh, his buddy had gotten killed last night and they brought him over to Bill's body. And, that's the first we knew that Bill had not made it. And we didn't find out that we started talking to the survivors later on about what took place down there in that battle. But apparently Bill, uh, once he waved off his helicopter, got real busy working with the wounded. Uh, while the fighting was going on, they say that the bullets are flying so thick that if you stuck your hand up, the hand would get shot away. So everybody's hugging the ground. I've talked to a lot of the Army survivors, several are here tonight with us, uh, they say that they'd only, a lot of them had only been over there two weeks. This is their first combat experience. They're right out of basic training and advanced infantry. They say their training back in the States didn't help them a bit for this situation. They had no, <coughs> no idea what, <coughs> what to do. Uh, most of them were just laying on the ground, firing at full automatic. Bill, in the meantime, was trying to get them to get up and move around. He was up, he was going to the perimeter. What the Army had done is the four patrols had formed a circle and were shooting outwards. It's called Form the Wagons. Um, and Bill was going out the perimeter, getting bodies or wounded troopers, dragging them back to the center of the circle, going back out and getting more. He was noticing that the Army guys were all running out of ammo, so he was crawling from body to body, grabbing uh, ammo clips and passing it to the uh, guys that were still effective. He uh, was working on the wounded much as he could with what supplies he had. He, uh, in one of Sergeant Navarro's case, uh, Navarro was hit real bad and he said that Bill covered him up with bodies to protect him from the bullets. So Bill was doing as much as he could down there. Uh, 
one of the lieutenants, uh, Martin Crow, said that he noticed that Bill was one of the few guys that was up and moving during that fight. Most of the guys were on the ground, shooting up in the trees, trying to get the snipers that were up there with the machine guns. Bill was up and moving constantly, working with the wounded, doing what he could. Um, they say that Bill got hit two or three times, so he actually got hit four separate times. And we're not sure exactly when uh, the fatal shot occurred. The Army knows more about that, but it hit us real hard to lose Bill like that. Uh, that. That's about the mission as far as I know. We ended up recovering nine of the wounded. There were 134 guys in the outfit that were involved in that battle that day. Uh, two of their officers were killed. Uh, they had 80% casualties. And uh, it was classified kind of as one of the bloodiest fights of the war as far as at that time and even later. And it shouldn't have happened because the Army knew that the enemy battalion was in that area. It was a battalion D-800, and they're estimated between 400 and 500 uh, soldiers in that unit. And uh, Charlie Company's mission was to locate their position and back off because we had the heavy artillery, we had fighters, we could uh, handle the situation. And Charlie was one of three companies on that push but they say the jungle is so thick that you couldn't see a man walking in front of you, hardly. Just two or three feet away, you couldn't see the man in front of him. They were just following each other, trying to fight their way through the jungle. And they actually walked kind of into the enemy base camp before they realized it. They were drawing sniper fire, and they can tell you more about this as far as I wasn't down there. But they are drawing sniper fire, and then when it got heavy, they formed the wagons. They had already called in artillery. Uh, for support, and one of the round, or one or two of the rounds hit them instead of the enemy. I didn't find out till years later that a kid from my hometown was one of the first ones killed in that battle. I met with his family years later, and they said I was the first person to contact him to give me any idea what took place during that battle. Nobody had ever contacted him before. The mission happened on 11 April 1966. Yes. Um, two helicopter formations, and you were on. I was on Pedro 9-7, uh, Bill was on Pedro 7-3, and a, a lot of the reports stated that Bill was off duty that day, and actually that's not true. Uh, we had uh, five helicopter crews, 20 crew members at Benoit, and we ran a uh, four-day rotation schedule. I was on the headquarters crew, which was the commander, the ops officer, myself, and the head mechanic, so we were spares, but we had a first alert crew. They flew all the firefighting missions, and they went on the off-base missions. But if we went off-base, we always took two helicopters, so we had the second alert. That was Bill. They always flew as cover on the off-base missions. Then we had the third crew, which if we flew an off-base mission with two helicopters, the third crew, if we had the third helicopter flying, would cover the local spot, local support. And then we had the fourth crew, which is off-duty. So we kept a four-day rotation like that. And Bill was second alert. He was on that mission, not as a volunteer. I mean, we're all volunteers, but uh, he didn't come off duty to fly that mission. He was second alert. He was supposed to cover me. I was low bird. He was high bird. And throughout the war, we flew in that low bird, high bird uh, combination on all of our rescue missions, even later on in North Vietnam. One side note, that H-43 was all we had in the early years of the war. Our H-43s would fly all the way up to Hanoi almost on recovery missions out of uh, Thailand. And uh, what they did was they take two 55-gallon fuel drums and put them back to that helicopter. Now, you know how small it is back there. It's only about four and a half feet high, uh, four or five feet across and six feet long. Those two fuel drums would take up most of the room in the back of the helicopter. And then they'd throw them out before, kick them out of the back end before the pickup. But the PJ was the refueler. He'd sit back there with a hand pump and pump fuel from the 55-gallon drums this is not an approved method, by the way. The Air Force didn't know about it. <laughs> They'd pump fuel into the tanks. And uh, one of my good friends who was stationed with in Guam, uh, Art Black, was shot down right outside of Hanoi and spent seven years as a prisoner of war. But he was on an HH-43, shot down in North Vietnam. So those little 43s did a great job until they got the heavy lifts in with the H-3s as far as uh, rescue at that time. The Army didn't want us over in Vietnam. Uh, we weren't invited. The Army said they can handle all missions with their Hueys, except the ropes weren't working out too well, trying to pick up pilots out of the jungle. 
and we had an ex rescue major at Saigon at MACV headquarters that knew about rescue and he's the one that got the Air Force to send our units over. So I was over the early stages of the war. I didn't get involved in those big North mission, uh, mi recovery missions with all the escorts and everything. We did our little local war down in South Vietnam with the HH-43, which is one heck of a bird as far as, uh, other than the size, it was fine for our rescue operation. We had uh, tinium steel inside for armor plating a little bit. The pilots had vest, steel vests they could pull down in front of them for protection. And uh, that, that steel plating weighed a lot, but it did save us a lot from uh, getting shot. Our uh, gas tanks were self-sealing, so we weren't worried about getting hit from below until on one mission we got hit from below and the bullets went right through those self-sealing gas tanks like butter. The tank sealed, but it didn't stop the bullets. And uh, the hoist driver got three or four rounds through his leg. From that time on, instead of wearing our flat vests, we sat on them on the missions. Uh, the mission, uh, the, the Pickenbarger, uh, the mission where Pickenbarger went down, where you had no communication with him uh, via radio the whole time? No, he had his uh, survival radio on the 243 emergency frequency, but he was too busy to turn it on or listen to it. So the Army was in contact with the Ford Air Controller that was circling us in the OV-1 bird, the, the bird dog, the Cessna. And so they'd talk to the Cessna pilot, and the Cessna pilot, the Air Force Ford Air Controller, would talk to us. But we had no communication with Bill other than hand signals. And I sent a note down to him. I attached a note to the litter. I said, get back up to your helicopter, Bill. And uh, he got the note, and he was, I think, going to go back up that last pickup when they got shot down. So he might have made it back OK if uh, they hadn't got in so close. You know, originally, um, they weren't very far from the perimeter, the bad guys. But the jungle was so thick that they could hear us, but they couldn't see us until they moved in closer. And they finally got a, a bead on the helicopter. And that's when they got hit real bad. But they got hit in nine different places, had several holes through the rotor blades. But uh, we had wooden rotors uh, that they say uh, blades of wood and men of steel. But uh, the H-43 rotor blades, uh, if we flew through heavy rain, they were covered with fabric and the fabric would start peeling off. So we carried duct tape and we'd land and duct tape the rotors and then take off again. But uh, we did what we could as far as <laughs> combat goes. So the PJ motto of jack of all trades really came into play. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were firefighters, medics, and... So uh, when, when <laughs> you found out about the uh, uh, Bill being shot on 12 April uh, after Harold Barron went down, um, who was the one that got the prize? He became the first Air Force Prize recipient, uh, enlisted Air Force Prize recipient? Yes, he was submitted for the Medal of Honor by... Uh, uh, either Captain Potter or Captain Salem, and uh, the uh, award, I made the mistake of contacting his parents. I wrote a letter to him and mentioned that he was in for the Medal of Honor, and it was downgraded to the Air Force Cross by Mac V at Saigon, as far as I know. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I could imagine the Army, this battle had severe implications in the Army about what was going on. Uh, they weren't used to taking casualties like that. And uh, Sergeant Robinson, one of the Army grunts, uh, got the Medal of Honor as well. He was the one that charged a 50 caliber machine gun and was killed, but he eliminated the position that machine gun, just wiping them out. And for the Army to approve a Medal of Honor for an Air Force airman involved in one of their battles, I don't think they really knew what was going on. They didn't know the scope of what he did. And uh, he was awarded the Air Force Cross, I guess, for the first enlisted man of the modern Air Force to receive it. And uh, my wife and I, <coughs> uh, my tour in Vietnam was 12 months long, but uh, I was yanked out of Vietnam about three months early to become one of the initial instructors at the Coast Guard National Search and Rescue School in New York, Governor's Island, New York. And uh, because of that, I was in New York when they awarded the Air Force Cross to his parents. And so my wife and I went down to the Pentagon and were part of that ceremony. Kind of amusing, I was walking down the hall of the Pentagon. I ain't had my Air Force blues on for five years, I think. And this three-star general stopped me in the hallway and said, Sarge, there's something matter with your uniform. I can't quite put my mind to it. He said, oh yeah, you got your ribbons on the wrong side. <laughs> I dressed in the mirror 
and headed backwards. <laughs> so I'm walking on the Pentagon with my ribbons on the wrong side and name tag. So he straightened me out. But uh, I was in the room with um, the presentation. I, I guess it was the president that presented the medal to him. And yeah, it was great he got the Air Force Cross and was the first one. But we were disappointed about that Medal of Honor that he didn't receive it. And uh, we're talking over the years about why he didn't get it. And then the effort started to give him the Medal of Honor. But the problem with that is you have to have new evidence to upgrade a medal, uh, significant new evidence. And Harry O'Byrne was a little more involved in the early communications than I was. Uh, he uh, was in contact. I guess it was the Airman's Memorial Museum that really got the ball rolling on this. I don't know what the whole background is, but a young man by the name of William Parker Hayes was assigned to the museum. And this is the Airman Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And he was given a job of trying to contact some of the people involved in that mission to get the recommendations for a Medal of Honor. It takes at least 10 recommendations like that, I think, at the time to uh, get it considered. And he contacted me uh, in a series of letters about trying to get the names of all the people involved in that battle and get our recommendations from us. And uh, I sent my recommendation in and along with some of our crew members. And the Army Mud Soldiers were the real push behind this on their because they knew what took place on the ground. And I think their letters from Lieutenant Johnny Libs uh, the first platoon leader who kind of ran the battle uh, from Lieutenant Martin Crow, from uh, several of the mud soldiers, uh, Sergeant David Peters. They made some real fine recommendations on what he did down below. And the, the Army unit, the mud soldiers, were really pushing to get Bill that Medal of Honor because he volunteered to go down on his own, work with them. I mean, to have an Air Force airman come down the ground during that battle and work with them in saving their lives. They thought that was pretty significant. And uh, we really gave up hope on it. And after about, this is in uh, about 1999, uh, we're getting frustrated by not hearing nothing. We kept calling in like the Air Force Sergeant Association saying, what's the status? Well, working on it, it's in the working. Finally, Harry O'Mearn got fed up with it. And he sent an email to the Secretary of the Air Force and said, uh, Mr. Peters, he sent an email directly to the Secretary of the Air Force, Mr. Peters, I'm Harry O'Byrne, what's the status of the Pittsburgh Medal of Honor package? And he got a reply back from the Secretary of the Air Force, probably half an hour later, said, Harry, I don't know, but I'll find out. And uh, Wilt Peters was a big push behind the Secretary of the Air Force, along with uh, Congressman uh, Bayer out of Ohio. But this may not be true, but what I heard was that he found the package in file 13 on the Chief of Staff's desk and renewed the package, and six months later, it was approved. Uh, I, I was invited to um, be guest speaker at the Air Force Material Command uh, Airman Sergeant NCO of the Year banquet right here at Wright-Patterson. And six months before the medal was approved, uh, I told the Pittsburgh story to uh, a pretty good crowd, not realizing that six months later, on the very spot I was standing, the medal would be presented to Mr. Pittsburgher, which was really something to me. But uh, it was a promise I made to Mr. Pittsburgh way back when I first met him about that medal, and it finally came true right before Mr. Pittsburgh passed away. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Bill's mom had passed away before that, so she didn't know about it. And uh, Mr. Pittsburgher married Alice, his high school sweetheart, with his wife's blessings before she passed away. So uh, Alice Pittsburgh has been really involved in this from the very beginning. I I'd like to take a little credit for uh, giving Todd Robinson the idea about the movie. Uh, I was invited along with Harry to be guest speakers out at our pararescue school in 1999 for uh, a dedication of the new pararescue barracks, Pittsburgh Hall it was named. And Bill, w or Harry was guest speaker for the graduation banquet that night and uh, a Hollywood uh, producer by the name of Todd Robinson attended that function along with our Air Force liaison officer in Hollywood and uh, Todd listened to uh, Harry's talk and my talk and I think Todd got kind of the idea there about this is worth looking into as far as making a movie of it and Todd bless his heart he worked 19 years on that project I know one time the studio burned down he lost everything he had to start from scratch 
But Todd Robson has been a great supporter of American military, American veterans, and uh, his dedication, 19 years of work to get that movie done, and he has finally accomplished it. So I really like to thank Todd and Sidney Sherman and all the rest of that production crew for being willing to dedicate so much of their life to the story of Bill Pitzenberger. Bill's a tough guy. He's my handball partner or, or tormentor. Man, uh, he played such a tough handball game that I wore the soles right on my tennis shoes and had to use cardboard. I, I still have foot problems today from playing pit handball with Bill Pittsburgh from pivoting around that concrete floor in my sneakers. He was a tough guy. Uh, I just want to ask one thing. What would you say to modern day PJs and modern day airmen? You know, uh, kind of the mission set sometimes is still the same. You know, we've, still, we've got this crazy war going on now. What would you say to a modern day airman right now if you had to speak to one? Well, I guess there comes a time in every military man that you've got to realize that uh, sometimes you have to sacrifice for the good of the mission, the good of your fellow man. And you may not be called upon ever to do that, but it may come to a time when you've got to make a decision on uh, what you're willing to do. One thing about Paris, I'd say there ain't a one of us that it aren't so going to hold that uh, for saving of life that will do anything, take any risk to get it done. Uh, including jumping to ships in the North Atlantic during a bad storm, ice storm, uh, just to save a life. But pararescue men go through two years of training now. They're much more, I mean, we thought we were maxed out mission-wise, but the modern-day pararescue man, he, he, he's a shooter. He's really something. I, I've got six PJs right now down in Florida doing my job. I work with the Emory Riddle ROTC unit on a rappel tower once a year. And, Today's the day that they're doing that. So I got some young PJs from Patrick taking over for me down there at Embry-Riddle. But anyway, uh, all of our training for two years is dedicated to one thing, that's saving lives. I mean, everything we do is that one goal, to go out and save lives. So Paris we got it ingrained in them that uh, these things we do, that others may live. And by golly, uh, there's not a Paris in one that won't risk his life to save somebody else's. And I take my hat off to him. What did you do after the war? Did you raise a family? Did you have any children? <laughs> well, uh, I had quite a few assignments in pararescue. My last assignment uh, was uh, chief of pararescue at headquarters before we had our officer corps. And uh, I uh, finished my college degree when I got out, I received a Bachelor of Education, but I decided I didn't like to be cooped up in a classroom. And I uh, started an agriculture farm. I'm a clam farmer. I, I, I uh, raise hard shell clams out in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm in underwater two days a week, roughly, working on the bottom, raising clams. I sell once a week the produce. I sell about 20 bushels a week, all year long, summer, winter. It's keeping me in pretty good shape. Keep the scuba bubble going. Keep the scuba. I, most of the time, I'm not using scuba. I just hold my breath and warp down. I'll spend two or three hours holding my breath, going down the bottom, working for a minute, come back up, get a breath, go back down. But uh, at higher tide, I use tanks. Your last job in the Air Force, you retired as Chief Master Sergeant. Chief Master Sergeant. I was Chief of Pararescue. And I had one goal. That was to start an officer corps in Pararescue. Pararescue started working with Special Forces, with Navy SEALs. I'd be going to conferences with a Navy captain and an Army colonel, and I'd be a chief. And they'd say, Chief, where's your officers? Well, we don't have any officers. So I got tired of that. And uh, I, I sent my first candidate down to Pararescue School. Unfortunately, uh, Captain Lutz had a heart attack down there. And, didn't finish training, but uh, after my time, years later, they finally started the uh, CROW, the Combat Rescue Officer Program. And now we have officer leaders all the way up to general now, as far as uh, pararescue men that have gotten commissions or officer pararescue men. Well, we appreciate your time. Your, your impact of, uh, within the, the whole career fields and within the military was huge. It was one adventure from beginning to end. Yeah.